And so, you know, that's when we began to change our fight from trying to prove what's wrong to politically moving those in power who have the ability to fix it. Right. So this is this kind of amazing moment when you transformed into an activist. And you tell the story about your first, one of the first meetings um, about Love Can Alley Held in Albany, which is 300 miles away and difficult and expensive to get to, but you and two other residents went. And, and you wrote this, this interesting comment about it, the first meeting you went into. You said, I was intimidated by the meeting. Me, Lois Gibbs, a housewife, whose biggest decision up to then had been what color wallpaper to use in my kitchen. Now, here we are going to Albany. It didn't seem real. But after that meeting, you really started to transform quickly. Yes. How did that happen? And, and how do you, when you think back on that now, what do you, what do you see? Like how, how did that, how did that happen? I always say, I always start the answer to those types of questions with, I never cussed before Love Connect. <laughs> <laughs> I never did. Taught Sunday school. Um, when I went to that meeting, and I went with, with my, my husband, who has since passed, to Harry, um, and my friend, Debbie Cirillo, who also went to Grand Island High School, but she likes the island. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, we went there thinking that we were going to present a petition to close the night night nursery school. We walked in, and this is no joke, we walked in, the three of us, and, and, and they said, oh, the meeting is down in the auditorium. And we were like, why is it in the auditorium? It's just three of us. We could meet in a smaller, oh no, it's in the auditorium. It's like, no, 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 no. We could, we could meet in a smaller place. No, go to the auditorium. So when we walked in there, the auditorium looked like a presidential press conference. There were so many media, so many cameras, so many microphones, and, and the journalists saw who we were, and it was like, oh, look at that people. And they all sort of like, ah. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was scary. I mean, those, those folks are, journals are really scary. <laughs> Trust me on this one. So, so we wouldn't talk to anyone because we didn't know. We were so confused and we were so out of place and we were intimidated. Um, and, and Debbie also was a high school graduate. And so we went and sat down in the front row and said, we'll talk to you later. And when they, then the health commissioner for New York State comes on stage and he says, well, first there was some other Jews that were talking about methodology and all that kind of scientific stuff. And then he was giving the conclusion. And his conclusion was he was declaring a state of emergency at Love Canal that pregnant women and children under the age of two must leave, or they would recommend them leaving immediately. And, and then they started talking about other, but we couldn't hear anything beyond that. I know that their mouths were moving and words were coming out, but it was so stunning. It was so. We're bringing a petition to close the 99th Street School, and they have just told us that Debbie Cirillo's two and a half year old daughter just lived in a place that could kill her because she was over two. And it was like, how can they do that? I mean, you know, I know about canaries and mines and things like this. My all of our neighbors work in in the chemical industry. My husband did. We understand all of that. It was just so terrifying. And the two-year-olds are going to like, where are they going to go? They're going to go live by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 it even gets more ridiculous. So <laughs> so I cussed that down. Debbie cussed that. I went all the way home. We're thinking, like, our parents are going to kill us. My mom's going to hear me say that F word. I said, no. <laughs> I've never used that F word before. And I became obsessed with this F word. Um, but but when we got to when we got to um, Niagara Falls, and my mother, who was watching the children, said, "Get over, there. get over to 99th Street now." I'm like, "Mom, oh, I just got home. I got to go to the bathroom. I got to like." And you didn't watch the news, did you? Because I didn't want to see you say the F word. Um, and she said, "Just go, just go." And so, so I went over there, and I'm kind of hiding, and. Um, I'm listening. They didn't have anybody at the community to tell them what was happening. They told us in Albany, New York, 300 miles away, that pregnant women and children are at risk. And there wasn't a soul, a soul at Love Canal that people could talk to. And it was just, oh my gosh. So there's this pregnant woman, and her husband's barely holding her up. And, she, and she's obviously pregnant. 
and she is sobbing. She is sobbing. What's happening to my baby? What has happened to my baby? What do I do? Where do I go? What does this mean? And there's no one, no one saying any, no one there. Like, what kind of government do we have that they can tell you you have to move? It's an emergency and no explanation. nothing. And no ways to meet. Like, there's, there's no money to move. Right. And move to where? Right? And of course, the two year olds have to bring their at least one parent with them, right? Somebody's got to change their clothes. And, um, you know, it was just shocking. And um, I, I was, I was, I'm a little bit in shock and a little bit just, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I just couldn't understand this is my country. This is where we live, the richest country in the, in, in, this is how they treat people? This is after we already learned about the Kelspan report. We learned about this and how come I'm worthless? How come my neighbors are worthless? How come we don't matter? And quickly, you became the face of Love Canal of this movement. And there were, you know, you and lots of your neighbors were organizing. But you really got got pushed to the front. And, and um, there was this tension between being dismissed continually as a woman, as a housewife. Um, but at the same time, you were getting all this attention because you were a young mother um, who had sick children. And you were standing up to the most powerful men in the state. Um, how did you navigate that tension between dismissal and this iconic status that you were starting to, to develop? Well, I don't think I actually understood the status, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, I, I was nominated because I knocked on everybody's door and they recognized my face, not because I was the smartest person in the hood, right? <laughs> it just is, they knew me. That's why politicians knock on doors. Um, and, Here's the thing, it's like we had, I had nothing to lose. So if Governor Kerry doesn't like me, well, do I really give a hoot? Because he's the only one who fixed this problem. And, and you know, a, a lot of people sort of use the analogy of the mother bear, you know, up on hind legs and protecting it. And that's really how I felt. I, I really didn't notice so much all of the other stuff. I think pe many people around me did, but, um, one of the things we did in organizing Love Canal, which I think was, uh, I was speaking earlier with someone about this, um, was brilliant, is that I was the leader, the face of the fight, but I wasn't the decision maker. And I think that helped to smooth that over because, you know, they can keep dismissing me as a housewife, but guess what? I didn't even make this decision. 550 people came to every meeting, if you look at the film clips, and every decision, major decision, was voted on by those people. You know, how many in favor, how many not. And, and I think that, that was the thing that, first of all, kept me grounded. Because sometimes I didn't agree with what folks would wanted to do. But I did it because I was you know, nominated to do it, and, and they voted. Right, right. Um, and very quickly, you developed these really sophisticated strategies and techniques around organizing. And, and earlier today, we were in the, in the UB archives, which has an amazing love canal connection, so all y'all should, should go check it out when you can. Um, but you were, you were talking about a couple things you learned that were both around reading people. Um, on the one side, you would choose speakers very carefully, um, depending on the tone and the emotion you wanted to convey for whatever the, the event happened to be. Um, and on the other side, you learned to read the various twitches of the men <laughs> in power that you had to deal with. You, you, earlier you told me it was called the twitch theory. Um, and, and, and so, <laughs> tell me about these twitches. But, but more importantly, like what? How did you learn how to read people like this, and and how did you use that strategically? We realized that it is the American people, and most New York people in particular, that was going to push the government to do the right thing, that we didn't have enough power in ourselves. And so what we wanted to do was use what we have to move the New York's population to go after the governor. And so how do you do that? That was the question on the table. And um, so the, a bunch of us leaders came together at my house. We, we did that often. 
uh, the guys were downstairs with the pool table and the beer and the chemicals. And the girls were upstairs with the wine and coffee and the strategy. Smart ones. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we came together and we were like, how do, you, how do we make them, like, what does Governor Kerry react to? Nobody knew. It's like, well, let's, somebody was talking about the, the VHS things, putting them in your, so we were putting these things in, a, in our uh, TVs and trying to see, replaying these different, different news conferences and things we were at. And, and it was like, wow, look at that. He really sat up straight and we said that. And he kind of like, and we said that. So that's not bothering him, but the thing that makes him stand up straight is bothering him. So, so there's something there. So we have to figure out what that something is. And if we hammer on the thing that makes him sit up straight, he's going to give us what we want. That was that is the theory, the twitch theory <laughs> that we use by looking at people's reaction. Because we knew that we, we had to move the politicians, and we knew that we were not big enough, rich enough, uh, and white enough, because we had a, a, a low-income community there, too, with 240 units. So, so, so that's what we did, and um, and our our theory was, there if it bleeds, it leads, right? Every news story we're looking at the news stories like, oh man, why did they start with Barbara Quimby again? Man, we've heard about her her children so many times. Can they start with somebody else? Because Barbara's story is so powerful, so powerful, um, and so so we would line them up so we would get to the public's heart by telling. Barbara likes story. She she has a child with three major birth defects and uh, lived there her whole life, so it was really sad. Um, and and then we would have somebody there who would tell a different piece of information we need to convey. When and you know maybe it's scientific, maybe it's a health study, maybe it's something else. And then every single speaker would say the word. It didn't always get copied, obviously, but would say who the enemy was or our opponent. So. You know, a, a quick story is Phil Donahue, this crowd probably doesn't know who Phil Donahue is, but Phil Donahue is to have an Edward Winfrey like show. And we went on the show with 43 of our residents. And we took over the bar the night before, not to drink, to <laughs> work, we were working. Um, and what we did is we practiced. So if Phil Donahue asks you a question, your answer is whatever, and you say, and Governor Hugh Carey can change that. Or Governor Cuomo can change that, or later it was President Carter can change that, right? And and so the first part of the show, that's exactly what happened. They they were trying to get us in this debate with the mayor who was sitting up front, and he was just like, Lois, what do you think about the mayor? Not much, but, and, and so and so can do what we want. And so it was a great strategy, and we noticed it was working. So now we had to figure out how to perfect it. And in that one, by the way, after the second commercial break, Phil gave us the show. He said, ladies, take it where you want. I'm with you. So, so you know, it was it was observation. You, mean, you can go to communication school and learn all this stuff, and I think it's really important to do that if you want to be a communicator of some sort. Um, but you also can learn this stuff on your own, and I guess that's my message for all of you. You know, if your professor is scratching his head, yeah, maybe you shouldn't ask him that question the next time, right? Um, <laughs> If you're, if you're angry at your professor, maybe you shouldn't say it to him. Find an 800 number of an opponent you don't like and call it and say it to them. I hate your products. I hate what you do. You're just a nasty human being. And then your professor will be fine and you can get your mark and the world will go on, you know, kind of thing. But, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not really that hard. It's really not that hard, and, and I think that we learned it extraordinarily well. And, and it wasn't Lois Gibbs who learned it all. It was this group. You know, we were a team of people. Right. But I, even though it's not hard, most people don't do it. So I think that's also one of the things that made your story so unique, because you all did all these things, which yeah. was amazing. Well, we did it because we had to. And I think it takes, it takes longer to execute something if you're doing body language. But why wouldn't you? Because the outcome, whether it's in a workplace or a school place or a family place, the outcome is always better. If you're talking to your mom and your mom is feeling like whatever, you know, read her language. And then figure out whether this is a conversation you should have now or later. I mean, it's just a general thing we all should do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life skills. Mm. So you fought this battle for two years. Um, and there were lots of partial victories along the way, partial setbacks, partial victories, back and forth. 
But in 1980, you and hundreds of other Love Canal residents took two Environmental Protection Agency's official hostage. Well, that's what the journal was called. <laughs> True, but in your book, that's what you called them too. <laughs> and so you said you do tell the story in the book that you were running around calling them hostages, and and your lawyer was like, "Don't say that word." <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, you took hostages, but you played it both ways. You were protecting the hostages and trying to negotiate their release with a whole bunch of folks from, you know, the the White House and the EPA to uh, a congressman and the FBI who, at some point, were threatening to charge in and, and or raid, you raid the place or shoot you if you didn't let them go within a few minutes. Um, so that's kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> and so later, it gets, it. It, gets more, it gets more amazing. So later that month, the White House announced that the federal government would evacuate all the remaining families. And later that year, you were standing next to President Jimmy Carter in Niagara Falls when he signed the bill to buy out all the houses at fair market value. So let's walk through that. How did you get from taking hostages <laughs> at a time when 52 Americans were being held hostage in the Iran, uh, Iran hostage crisis? Right? How, did you, how did you get from there to winning your demands and meeting the President of the United States? It was a long road. <laughs> we, we were, we, we were, in May of 1980, when, when we were detaining those two EPA gentlemen for their, their own protection against the maddening crowd up front. <laughs> we still trying to keep yourself out of jail. <laughs> no, they said they weren't going to arrest me, so I think I'm good. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest anybody ever do it. But at that point, here's what we were told. This was, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and this is why it wasn't planned. It wasn't, you know. And we were told we shouldn't go into our basements, we shouldn't go to our yards, we shouldn't eat out of our gardens. Women should not become pregnant. If they do become pregnant in any part of the neighborhood, you can leave until your child reaches the age of two and then you must return. <laughs> or your, term, your, your pregnancy terminates before a healthy birth. We were told, like, both schools were closed. We shouldn't, so our, our children are being bused out of school. Around our neighborhood were, were school buses waiting to evacuate us if, during the construction, something happened. We're living, but there's no problem so far, right? <laughs> this is not, not a problem. And then they said they took a chromosome test. So chromosome testing was to determine whether or not we have this particular type of broken chromosome, which I can't pronounce. Um, and if we do, then we are more likely to have a cancer or birth defect in child. But the straw that broke the camel's back was, was twofold. One, they said that if we had an increase of this, it will likely affect our children. So I'm holding my daughter. I saw your daughter. She's adorable. I'm holding my daughter, and I'm thinking that your whole life has just been altered by chromosome damage, which means cancer or birth defect in children or... I mean, the whole line of the family has been dramatically changed. And then second, life of August 2nd, they didn't have anybody there to talk to the community. They talked to individuals who came in and got their results, and then they left crying, most of them. Um, and there was nobody there to talk to the community. Like, what is wrong that you can give this horrible news and not have somebody there to explain to the neighborhood what does this mean in the bigger picture? And so we, I, as a leader, I, I thought all you guys are going to be leaders, guys and girls, whatever. Um, if things get really bad, you get targeted. So the best thing you can do, find a different target. So what I did is I called up the EPA officials that were still hanging in town and asked them to come to the office and explain to people what was going on. Because if I hadn't, I would have been the target. And so we did that. Um, they came. We put them in the house. We closed the door. And we said, you can't leave until we leave. And I'm like, and then I called the White House and said, we were holding hostages. I didn't use the term. But it was shorthand for not having to say, 
We're protecting these gentlemen against that big maddening crowd out front that seems to be getting larger and they're drinking beer and it's getting dark and you know, so hostages, which is a shorthand. Um, and so the woman who answers the phone, it's like, again, yeah, our government was like, every step, I'm shocked. I'm just shocked. It's shocking. Yeah, the woman answers the phone and she says, you know, Miss Gibbs, lots of people get cancer. <laughs> lots of people have problems. I'm like, you're not special. Yeah. And I said, Look, lady, if I wasn't crazy, I'd kill these hostages right now. I'm going to the phone. I am not crazy. I'm sure that used to But But it was, um, it was really hard. And what we did is we, we really pushed people in front of the media. Again, now we needed a bigger, we needed a bigger public that was going to say, look, help those people. They did nothing wrong. They played by the rules. They're hardworking human beings. Um, and so we really pushed, we called it the horror story of the week, where we would have a journalist come and talk to a victim, and they would tell this very sad story, uh, and they would say, and President Carver has to do something about it, because now he's our target, right? And um, so the way we ended the hostage thing was, again, with our target. We knew who our target was, not, not in a negative way, but the person who can give us what we want. Target's really a bad word, but it's a word I often use, and I'm sorry for that. But, um, so when, when they said they were going to come and rush the crowd, I went out front and said, give me, give me a few minutes. I went out front and said, look guys, we sent our message. Congressman LaFalse was meeting with the president for dinner that evening. Um, and let's give them till Wednesday at noon. And if they don't do something Wednesday at noon, we will make this look like a Sesame Street picnic to what we're going to do Wednesday at noon. And then we took a vote because we voted on everything. And the honest answer is I'm not sure that I actually read that vote right. Yeah. <laughs> but you knew what the result had to be. <laughs> yes. So, so, so I said, the FBI right there. <laughs> they're right there. They're, they're just going to come and take them. That would have been, that would have been awful because the crowd would have, yeah, it would just would have been messy. Uh, people would have got hurt. There's children in the crowd and moms with babies. And, um, so, so the, we let them go. And we gave them Wednesday till noon. And before you let them go, is it true that you made them open cookies? Yes. Well, I didn't make them. I, I'm not a very good cook. But I, I, there were oatmeal cookies. And, and our, yes, we did let them go. And so one of our hostages, Frank Nicole, he was the EPA communications guy. Dr. Lucas was the cytogeneticist. And so he, the following day, he sent me a telegram. Yes, they still had telegrams back then. <laughs> and in the telegram, it said, I hope you get what you are working for, your happy hostage, Frank. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for the oatmeal cookies. Well, I thought he was actually saying thank you. Um, but what I realized is he was a communications guy. He was saving our butt. Right? Because if anybody was going to say we were harassing them or, you know, we got this thank you for your oatmeal cookies kind of thing. Like, it's not going to hold up in court really well, right? And so I'm like, oh, wow, that was really great. So just a quick side, I called him when I was in New York one time, and his mother answered the phone. I said, is this the right Frank Nepal? And he's like, yeah, the one who works for EPA, yeah. I said, is he there? No, he's in Boston. I'm like, oh, okay. Can you just tell him Lois Gibbs called and said thank you? She'll the person who held my son hostage? Are you calling my house? I'm sorry, you didn't mean to upset you. You gave him all your cookies. And he liked them. He said they were better than yours. So it was, I, I mean, I, you know, it was, it was really hard. It wasn't a planned thing. I don't think we would ever plan anything like that. We were all anti-violence and, and stuff like that. But you... There was just nowhere else to go. Well, you had to manage, I mean, as you said, there's this crowd of a lot of dudes and a lot of alcohol building up. I mean, you have to manage reality, too. Right, and um, Barbara, Barbara Quimby held uh, the hostages with me. It was the two of us. Um, she's she's like five foot two and 100 pounds, maybe. Um, really, we're only women here. <laughs> and, and so um, her, we, we slept with our clothes on for the next three weeks. I figured at some, some point somebody's going to come and arrest us and we didn't want to go to jail in our jammas. <laughs> so we thought we were going to get arrested. Yeah, wow. So precisely Wednesday at noon, everybody gathered at the homeowner's office 
and I put a chair outside the window, or someone did, I didn't, um, and stood there and we called the White House and asked them what they were going to do Wednesday at noon. And they, that's when they agreed to evacuate all residents temporarily until permanent relocation could be secured. And so the thing, the thing was that we were able to move enough of the general public across this country during a hot political campaign for President Carter, who didn't win. Right, so um, big, yeah. big, big, big change. Big change. And, and you know, it was, it, was a, it was a powerful movement in, in a little tiny community of people who were powerless for many, 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 many decades. Right? And you all found that you really could move politicians when it was that election year, when, when, the, when the election was coming, whether it was governor. Carrie or Cuomo or, or the president, mm -hmm. and you got Carter to to act during his presidential year. Yes. So so here's the other piece of story uh, that you might want to hear. So when how did I get on stage? They weren't letting me on stage. You don't think they were inviting me on stage? <laughs> I'm a, I just tell hostages that they come. You know what? Um, so when we when we went to the ceremony, everybody was there: the governor, the mayor, and everybody else. And I, they, they invited me to be in the audience, so I sat on the aisle, and everybody said, no, you have to move in, you cannot sit on the aisle. Yeah, I'm sitting on the aisle. I'm still sitting on the aisle, and I sat on the aisle. Um, and then, at some point, I had to stand up, and the, the community had asked me to ask them for low interest uh, loans, interest rates, because the interest rates on home loans then was 12%, it was huge. Um, so, so I'm like, I don't know how to do this, right? Long story short, so after, after a couple of speeches, I stood up, and Secret Service immediately surrounded me and said, you must sit down. I'm like, I'm not sitting down, I'm gonna scream. I'm gonna scream. I'm just gonna scream until you let me up front. And they're like, she's gonna scream. And they said, okay, let her go. And so I went to the front of the stage, and, and Senator Jacob Javis was on stage, and he was the one who invited me up on stage. And then, you know, that's how I ended up there. They did not intend to bring me on stage. They were, and there's, there's two reasons for it. One, they didn't trust me, and there's good reason for that, obviously. Um, but, but they don't want people to know that they can do that, right? The, the powerful doesn't want you to know that if you have a high school education and you're, uh, you know, a, a chemical operator in a local plant and you've never had much more than what you got, that you can't have that kind of power, and we're not going to recognize that kind of power. Right. And that really was what that, what that was about. And and we knew that, which is why I'm like, no, I'm going to scream, because I have nothing to lose. I still have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Yeah. Well, it's it's a remarkable story. Um, and, and when it was all over, you write that when you first became concerned about the buried chemicals at Love Canal, you were concerned just about your own children. But by the end, your circle of concern had expanded considerably. Um, and you tra transitioned from my backyard to everyone's backyard. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about how that transformation first changed your life. But then, um, have you seen similar transformations happen with activists that you've worked with around the country? Um, is after this was over, people were calling you from everywhere, being like, "We have this bit in our backyard, and what do we do? And how do we, how do we, how do we read the twitches of the politicians?" <laughs> well, they didn't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> and so you became, you started going around all over the country and helping other communities. So, so tell me about that that transformation there. So the question you asked earlier was about how much I recognize my own power and. That's when I recognized my own power. That, or whatever recognition, whatever, whatever that word was used. And um, people were calling me and saying, "You have to come help us. We have this here with that, or they're going to put one of those there, or whatever it was." And I'm thinking, like, you know what? I know something. It's just that simple. I know something, and I have some recognition with the public that I actually could go out there, because you know, one of the things is like, the media won't cover me. They won't cover our story, they won't talk about it. How'd you get the media to cover? You know, those kind of questions are very simple questions, but they're very 
um, critical. And so that's when I realized I had some level of, of power and notoriety that made sense that could help other people. And so I would go to neighborhoods um, and we always had a deal. I didn't go anywhere for free. So there was always a deal that, you know, even when I raised millions for my organization, um, you have to pay for something. You have to pay for something. Now, it might be give me a room. It might be make supper, you know, give me supper. But everybody had to pay for something. So it was a give and take. It was a relationship as opposed to me going in and telling them what they should do and walking away. Um, and I watched these people, all different people, all different walks of life, um, go from where I was as someone who was just minding their own business to then organizing a neighborhood and the neighborhood itself becoming organized and powerful to make the change. And that is the most rewarding thing ever. I mean, people say, why aren't you burnt out? Why aren't you angry as hell? Why aren't you? Because I see the transformation of men and women of all different, um, you know, religions and cultures and, you know, I always laugh about you have to go down the south and you have to clean up your act, you know, and, and then you go north and if you don't cuss, they don't believe you're real, you know, then you have these and you have the independent mountain people and you have to learn about the culture, but oh my gosh, you know, going in and training people how to do this, how to learn about the Twitch theories. Well, when you said that, what did he say? And what did she say? And what, you know, and it was, it's just very rewarding work. And, and what, uh, in your own life, think back to when you first arrived at Love Canal and the future you saw for yourself. Your future changed pretty dramatically after you left Love Canal. So, uh, you know, in your own life and in your own sense of who you were and what you were going to spend the rest of your life doing, how did, how did that shift? It didn't shift. It just flipped. <laughs> it, was, it was not a shift. It was, you know, I was like, I can't go back to being a full-time homemaker. I, and I know too much. I, I understand how the world works. I have something to share that I think is worthy of sharing. And, um, you know, I've got to go do that. It really became a path of compassion and compassionate kind of thing. And, um, and then, you know, and I'm what I'm really good at is strategy. And so, and what people really have a hard time with is strategies. And so, you know, that was something like, uh, let's, let's have a strategic meeting and talk about strategies and who's your target and why are we your target and how do you, you know, how do you make them do what you want them to do and, and so forth. And um, it was, it was a totally different, it was nothing I would imagine right. in Grand Island. I wanted to get off the island, success. <laughs> I wanted to get married, success. I wanted kids, great. Um, and, but beyond that, I was going to go to nursing school and help seniors. Seniors happened to be my favorite uh, thing. But um, then it was just like the whole thing changed. And after you left Love Canal, you moved to Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, where you were hoping to continue raising your children away from dangerous toxic chemicals. Um, but soon you learned that dioxin, which is one of the deadly chemicals that was buried under Love Canal, um, you learned that it's pervasive in the environment, in the environment particularly in the bodies of animals, our bodies, and the milk and bodies of animals in our food system. Um, and in your book, Dying from Dioxin, here's something you wrote. You said, we can't shut down the sources of dioxin without finding the courage to change the way government works. And I think you could easily substitute other things for dioxin here. You could say, we can't shut down the sources of endocrine disruptors, or PFAS, or greenhouse gases, without finding the courage to change the way government works. So how do we find this courage, and, and how must government change? You know, the courage is really hard to find, and it's become even more difficult today. And it's not because people aren't courageous, people in this audience aren't courageous, they most certainly are likely more likely than not, um, but people have to stand up and speak out. That's what encourage them. People have to be willing to take a risk, and most people are not. Right. I mean, I literally was just in Alabama, in, in Birmingham, and a professor at the university I was speaking at said, I am not going to speak out against Alabama power, because I'll lose my job. <laughs> Okay, I get that. But how do you do it with a bunch of people and you don't lose your job? 
It's not about you speaking out. And I think that's where people get confused. Um, if I'm speaking out, then I'm going to lose my job. And it's really, if you come with 100 people speaking out, you're not going to lose your job. You're not as likely to lose your job than lose your job is, but, right? right. Um, and, and so the only way we're going to change this, and, and we've seen what happened with climate change. I mean, this year has been extraordinary on the East Coast, West Coast, I and mean, everywhere. That if people aren't willing to stand up and take some risks, I mean, stop being safe. And if you lose your job, is it really the end of the world? Because we're losing the planet. How many children are being born out there with endocrine disruptors and genetic damage? And how, you know, the world has shifted because since really since 9/11, people have become less and less likely to stand up and speak out. And the opponents of this, people who want to make money and keep power, and have really used that to to frighten more and more people. And you know, the the other thing I heard just a couple weeks ago was, well, you know, I got my student loans I have to pay back, and I got this. And that. Yeah, okay, but. So you could be a successful lawyer for Dow Chemical, Godspeed, honey. <laughs> Why is that a meaningful job? It is a meaningful job if you can get Dow Chemical to stop doing what they're doing in different places and only do the right thing. But you're not going to do that. That we really need, I, we're in a critical moment, I think, here. I would not have said this 10 years ago. But I think right now we're in a critical moment. That if we are so afraid and fear is being pushed out there by every journalist, like everything, like the, the Republicans and Democrats, the independents, the companies, the economy, the banks collapsing. I mean, there's fear, fear, fear. That's all you see and hear. And we're not hearing these positive stories. And people are becoming a little more distant from the realities in front of them and wanting to change it. And I think that, I think that is at a critical stage now that I'm not sure how to generate the energy and, the, and the, the masses, we need to make that change, but we need to do it soon. Yeah, yeah and you talk about, in your account of, of Love Canal, I mean, it's interesting how this university played a, a big role, because you, you had a lot of interactions with a lot of university mm -hmm. professors and, and other folks, and some of them put their necks on the line, yes. and some of them did not, and you had some words about the terrified, untenured, uh, professors who wouldn't do anything because they were scared. I'm not a genuine professor. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that it, I, I see it over and over again. Like, well, you gotta make money. You gotta, you gotta oh, fulfill some, some strange idea about what your life is like. My husband and I drove here because we have lots of family things to do in addition to this in the meeting tomorrow. And one of the conversations we had was, was about wants. And, and we were talking about someone in particular, but then I, you know, I said to him, I was like, I don't want for anything. We don't make a lot of money. We, I've worked in charity my whole life. I could have, I could have made a lot of money. But, but so, so you want this job as a professor or tenure or whatever, but is that really the most important thing in your life? And you really need to examine that. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you doing what you're doing? Yeah. Are you just trying to keep up with the Joneses? And, and actually, research professors, I have to tell you, you're one of my biggest pains. And the reason <laughs> is because you'll never, you'll never give your research to the public until after you've had it peer-reviewed and published. And it's like, it's too late. <laughs> how many people, how many rivers, how many creeks have died while we're waiting on that? that there's got to be... And I'm not saying you shouldn't ought to do that, because you know that's part of the, the curriculum. But we we need to think of other things we can also do. Like, can we do something that talks about what's happening to the Niagara River? It's not a published research document, but rather a statement about what we we are observing and what our students are observing and what humans are observing or fish are. You know that it, it it can't be the the line I use with um, with my communities. If you play by the rules, and that's all playing by the rules, by the way. If you play by the rules, we always lose. Rules have been created for people to hold on to power, whether it's money power or you know places in society power. You ever go to a hearing or something like that, they like, you have three minutes, like, huh? <laughs> go to your city council. They'll tell you you got three minutes in the beginning, and you better sign up. No. This is 
my city. This is my council. Right? So when you play by the rules, and this is about research and other things, there's important things, you know, that you need to do. But we gotta find something else. Yeah, for sure. Well in February of this year, there was a train derailment in yes. East Palestine, Ohio, that released hazardous chemicals including vinyl chloride. Um, and one of the emergency responses was a controlled release and burn of the vinyl chloride, um, which potentially produced dioxin. That was a major, major environmental catastrophe. And at least a couple of the train cars carrying the vinyl chloride were traceable to Oxidel Petroleum, mm -hmm. um, which in 1968 bought Hooker Chemical, which was the company that dumped all the toxic waste above the canal. And it's kind of unbelievable how connected all of this is, and, and really how it never ends. It, and it reminds me of something you said on a TV show back in 2003, which was, Love Canal is never, oh, I'm sorry, Love Canal is not over. Love Canal will never be over. How do you see a pathway for it to end? Can you see a pathway for it to end? I'm hoping there's a pathway. I cannot see that pathway. I cannot say, it. and I think part of the reason is back in the 70s and the 80s, there was a lot of street organizing around this. You wouldn't have had in East Palestine and not had Greenpeace there and all these other people there and raising issues. I will tell you, our organization, the Center for Health Environmental Justice, is working with those folks one on one. There's nobody there. Aaron Brockovich showed up and left, and other people showed up and left, but there's nobody there to. I mean, other than Stephen and my science director and a couple of our staff, but there's nobody there. What? Why? Why is that? People just like why did they burn all those car loads full of vinyl chloride? The most toxic. It's so toxic, right? Why did they? Do, and why is the world outraged? It's not only about the folks there and the fish and the creek and the river. That all went up into the sky. When we talk about climate change, I mean. Why isn't the world outraged by the way that has been treated? And I will tell you, you go in, and our staff has, you go into those houses and around that site, your eyes begin to tear. Your throat is dry, you get sick, you get a headache. But they're saying it's perfectly okay, that there's nothing there. Yeah, I read in an article that a bunch of the CDC workers and EPA workers are all sick. Yeah. They went in to investigate. Yeah, and, and you know, and what? how did that all happen? Well, Ohio's really bad on regulations and enforcement. I mean, it's one of those states, right? Um, and they just let the railroad company dump those and burn them. And we had firemen coming and saying that was the worst thing they could ever do. And these are firemen who understand chemical burns and stuff like that. They're not expert toxicologists, but they understood that was the stupidest thing anybody could do. But they let them do it because they wanted to remove the liability from the railroad. It was about the corporation, protecting the corporation, and we are now in this place in this country. I mean, I mean, it's connected. This is connected right to the White House. That they are worried about transportation of goods and services because since the pandemic, we've had a problem. And so they had to open that railroad. It goes, you know, east and west or north south. I don't know. It goes one way. <laughs> it actually goes two ways. <laughs> Okay, it goes east and west. And and so all the goods and services coming in from Washington State, from California, from have to get to the East Coast or, or vice versa. And they needed that open. And they, a, an Amazon package might take more than two days to get there. Yeah. That would be a total travesty. Absolutely. Or your or your lithium battery for your new car that you're gonna get, right? right. <laughs> but but they they wanted to open it. So once they burnt that they could move the move the train cars and then the rails open. That's, I mean, it's all, it's all connected to, it goes back to corporate control in dollars, isn't it? I remember when the internet first began. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and all the utopian thinking about there's going to be this open information and everyone's going to know everything. It's happening all over the world all the time and we're going to have this amazing democracy and accountability and this and that. And then, and then smartphones came and then everyone could be there being their own reporter. How is it going? Like, as you said, we have a Netflix movie about this thing that happened in Ohio before it happened, two yeah. months before a big 
a big uh, Noah Baumbach movie came out. Mm -hmm. And everyone sits at home and watches it on Netflix and feels like, oh, they they know it, but no, nobody's out there. Mm -hmm. Nobody's out there. No, no one is screaming for change. Right. Everybody's hiding under the table or the bed. No one's writing folk songs about it. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's the other thing. There's no art and environmental movement. Right. There's no folk songs. There's no sense of, you know, you had uh, you had different people doing concerts. You had, you know, different Earth Day events that were really Earth Day events based on real humans doing stuff, not corporate sponsored things that they right. do. Greenwashing. Yeah. Today we're going to recycle everything in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, how nice! You know, waste <laughs> management. They just put it in their dump, right? <laughs> Well, a lot of people see the legacy of Love Canal as the Superfund legislation that passed shortly after you won the uh, relocation. How do you think the Superfund legislation has succeeded or failed? Um, and, and what do you think needs to change about how we clean up or prevent toxic pollution from happening in the first place? In the so Superfund has been very successful at the beginning. It was collecting, it collects money from taxes on certain chemicals and oil and crude. Um, and it cleaned up a number of sites. It really, I think, they, I think they did really well. Then the funding stopped. And in 1995, with the Superfund went bankrupt. And so now the taxpayers are putting money into Superfund. And it's not, it's not very good at all. Right, and the idea was the polluting industries were supposed to be paying. Right, exactly, exactly. And so, so it's not cleaning up very many sites, obviously, because it doesn't have any money. And there's another thing about Superfund that's real interesting. It's called triple damages. So it's a legal thing. It says, if you make a mess and I want you to clean it up, it's going to cost us, and you refuse to clean it up, you want to take me to court, I think it's triple damages, meaning if I won, instead of 20 million, you're going to give me 60 million. It was a big hammer that was never used in Superfund until Trump took over. And Trump actually did use it. Yeah, yeah it's surprising. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to do anything with the environment. You know, this summer fund is little isolated pockets, right? So he can say he's doing something for the environment, but it's really these isolated pockets. But I mean, that was there too. That was really, you know, extraordinary. So. You know, we're still trying to get Superfund reauthorized, the, the fee, because without the fee, it's never going to be cleaned up. And, and actually, they're not cleaning them up anyhow. At best, they're containing them more than anything else. And so that means, you know, at some point, it's going to leak again in some way. And, and we've seen that actually down in the south, where there were cleanups, and then the tornado comes through, or a hurricane comes through, or flooding comes through, or Katrina, Katrina took the one in southeast New Orleans out entirely. Uh, agriculture street landfill. So, so you know, these are these are things that need to be cleaned up right. at some point. And that's why campaign finance reform is so important, and why um, election integrity is so important, and all these things because it, the corporations have so much influence over government. Yes, and, and people don't vote. Right. I mean, if people voted. Even the corporations with all their dollars, because we've seen this in smaller, small elections, not presidential elections, obviously. Um, but you can win. Like, if you turn people out, you can actually win. And you can turn over a city council or a town council. And then you can move that person or persons up the, up the ladder to, you know, government level. Right, right. But, but I, I do want to add one more thing to the legacy of Love Canal. And I, I think Superfund is important. I agree with that. But here's what Love Cadell really did, I think. Two things. They op we opened the world's eyes, not just US, but the worldwide eyes, to the fact that chemicals in the environment create health and health, whether it's birth defects or cancer or other diseases. Before that, it was only about the workplace. That was all that was there. There was nothing about the community. And, and so I think that was really a legacy that we, we are quite proud of. And, Beverly Pagan deserves most of the credit for that. Um, and then the second thing is, Love Canal really shows how democracy works. If you engage in democracy, if you can go all the way to the White House. I mean, I was standing next to President Carter, and it wasn't just because I snuck out and said I was going to scream. It, it, was, it was all that time beforehand that they knew there were people behind me who was power. They also knew that the public, beyond the Niagara Falls community, was looking at what was happening, and then it mattered to the public, and if it matters to the public, then it matters to the politicians. 
And so if we don't have money, which most of us don't have a lot of, um, we can organize people. And, and Love to Know really showed that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think another legacy is how much love can now change the environmental movement itself. Because um, before that, it was really focused on conservation and ecosystems and not human health and not urban environments, not suburban environments. So can, can you talk a little bit about that, of, of um, you know, how love can now change environmentalism? Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, how did the environmental movement, the broader movement, how did it change you? as all of this was happening. <laughs> well, I don't know about that one. <laughs> that was the first one. Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so when we were organizing Love Canal, we called really good people in New York State here, Sierra Club and so forth, and said, what do we do? And they're like, pass a bill. I don't think that's gonna help. You know, I don't even know what to talk about. Um, and, and so the, the green movement really was about the natural environment, and there was no movement that was about the humans in the environment, the humans as a, as a species, right? Um, and so Love Canal really brought that to life, and, and you know, that it, it can't just be about this or that. It really has to be about human health. People have to be at the center because if they're gonna die, so is everything else, by the way. Um, you know, the same, the same argument they were using about endangered species. You know, we were becoming an endangered species if you were in a low-income community or a community of color or da-da-da, right? Um, and so, so that was really hard, and then the environmental movement didn't know what to do with us. So we became larger, uh, not larger than them, but larger, larger than Love Canal. And, and once we became large, then they're like, what are we going to do with you? And they kept bringing us, bringing us, the bigger us, to these meetings to ask our opinion, and then they would do what they always did before, because that's what they know how to do, right? <laughs> and, but it was really interesting, because at one meeting we had, we really made it crystal clear that here's, here's the problem, is that those who are working on legislation, whether it's local, state, or federal, they are really looking at control. How much can come out of the stack? How much can go into the water? How much can go into the land, right? And if you're a community person, you're looking at prevention. What can we do instead of this? Why do we need plastic bottles? Why? Um, and, and so they, they, they have such uniquely different goals and focus that the two of them will never really be able to move forward as one because the people in the streets would have to accept the fact that some level of chemicals or bad stuff is okay for them. And that's not an acceptable thing, right? And so that's where the split comes. And, and, and they still, to this day, quite honestly, don't have a whole lot of respect for the women organizers across the country who are in these communities because they're not educated. And, you know, I remember one time somebody said, sitting at a meeting and they leaned over me and said, could you explain to Lois what, to my science director, what risk assessment is? And he said, oh no, she's gets it. <laughs> she knows what it is. Um, because we're, just, we're still being dismissed today because we're women and because we may not have a formal education beyond high school, but it does not mean we don't know what we're speaking about and, and the value of that. Um, and the movement today is actually pretty extraordinary because it is a movement of people of color, of low wealth, um, it's indigenous people, and they have all come together to begin to move in a way that is making it unacceptable, unacceptable to poison communities because of their class, because of their race, because of their geographic location, right? And so that's huge, and, and from there there's also this realization that, oh, gee, the reason we're by this refinery in Ca Cancer Alley is that it was the only place black people were allowed to live. Right. You know, that, and, and the environmental groups sometimes don't get that. They're like, well, why don't they move? Well, it's not quite that easy. So, so there's communication problems, there's education problems, but, you know, they're both moving forward in the way they can, and, and neither one is right or wrong. They're both incredibly s strong, but the, they're never going to work together one-on-one. -on -one. Right. And in terms of one thing you touched on is this idea of, you know, Superfund is about clean, cleaning up disasters. And how do we prevent them from happening in the first place? And it seems like it's so hard to get to that point of the plastic bottles and the consumption and the 
gasoline and the vinyl and the clothes and the everything. Right? There's just so much stuff now. There is stuff. And we, you know, we talked about sustainability. I talked to a few people around the campus today about the sustainability. And the, and the thing is that the way sustainability is being pushed in this country is really harmful and not helpful. And one of, the, one of the examples, I think one good example, is this whole, in New York State in 2024, you can't have a gas stove. <laughs> right? But I was in your dining area, and there's gas all around where the students sit and read, study, chat, whatever they do. Or there's lots of places, hotels and high-end homes that have gas fireplaces. Why are we beginning to talk about gas being a problem, which it is, I'm not denying the problem, but why is the beginning that we take people's stoves away <laughs> as opposed to what you have in your lobby or at somebody else's? So when you talk about sustainability, or, or we can talk about electric cars in, what, 35, if Brian wants some wonderful number, well, good for him. And, and who's gonna buy those cars? Like the students here can afford for sure. Oh, maybe some of them. Not. <laughs> but but you know who's going to buy them? And what is the what is the price of those cars? And we don't have the wind and the solar to, you know, what are we doing? And where are we? Where are we getting the battery? The stuff for the batteries? We're digging in people's property. We're creating new love canals across the world, yeah. right? So so to say it's electric car and it's clean, well, yeah, in one way, but we have to follow the food chain all the way around. And so I think, I, I believe in sustainability, and I think it has to happen. But I think people who are working in sustainability have to get their butts together and their heads together and figure out how they do it so it doesn't look like it's moving poor people and working class people to do without like those who have continued to have. It's just not right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I do think your casting is beautiful. <laughs> well, related to that, I wanted to ask you, here's another kind of connection of things. In, in 1962, while you were still in grade school, Rachel Carson wrote in Silent Spring about the dangers of our efforts to control nature. And specifically, she was talking about DDT, the devastating unintended consequences it has for hurts people and other living things. <clears throat> and then back in 1946, uh, Hooker Chemical Company started producing DDT in their plants here in Niagara Falls. Um, and this is the period they were dumping toxic waste at the Love Canal. Um, and the canal itself is there because another industrialist, William Love, wanted to build an artificial falls higher and more powerful than Niagara Falls itself. But abandoned his partially built canal and his grandiose dreams before it was completed, which gave a perfect pit for Oker Chemical to dump their DDT and other waste into. Um, and I, I was just wondering if you could reflect on this idea of, of over the course of your lifetime, how do you see the control of nature and the hubris and the foul? <coughs> yeah, I'm. Oh no, you know it's. Did you bring up the technology? You know, one thing I think about sometimes is we love techno fixes for things, and the environmental discourse right now is so much about the stoves and the electric cars and the solar panels and all that, and all that is very important. But we want to do more and more and more and more when a lot of what we need to do is less and less and less. And that's not part of the conversation most of the time. Right. And it, it's not part of the conversation. It should be. It should be. That's what I want to do. This, that would be my goal. But you can't make money on doing less. No. That's the problem. I always said if we could give Exxon the sun rights to the sun, everybody would have solar power. Because because if they would charge everybody and they would be have an incentive to build solar power on everything, right? So so less is better, but how do we get to less when we have a capitalist economy? And you know, the fight that was happening out west just recently is between solar solar panel farms and farmers. 
who don't want solar panel farms on rich farmland. And, and yet they have nothing to do. They can't say anything about it because they don't own the property, right? It's being bought by the solar power people. And so, so I agree with you. I just, my, my problem is I don't know how you get there. Right. And, and, and it's a, well, it, I guess it only works if people stop buying products. And that's not going to happen either because everybody wants a new iPhone. Yeah. Well, it goes back, I think, to your comment about changing government. Yeah. You know, we need to change the relationship we have with government. We need to change the, the relationship the government has to private mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. and to the flow of money and the accumulation of ridiculous amounts of, of cash and capital by a very number of people. I mean, I remember going overseas a long time ago and just being amazed at how they have plastic everywhere. You know, and they wrap your stuff in paper, and you bring your own bags, and you know they have glass bottles, and they fill your your container, and you know there's just there's just something about that. It's not it's not unacceptable, and it's quite a nice way to live, by the way. Yes. Um, and yet, if you can't make money, it's not going to happen in America, and that's the problem. Fundamental. Gas stations right every corner. It's well, that, not when you have to, you better have some plug-in things. <laughs> True. Very good. Well, what does the fight for environmental justice look like today? And, and how have your strategies and techniques that you're using in the work you're doing now, have they changed or not changed over the last half, half century almost? Yeah, the environmental justice movement is really growing. It's still growing. It's really big. There is recognition. I mean, universities now have classes on environmental justice. Holy moly! How'd that happen? Right? Um, and, and you know, it's growing and it's, it is learning from itself. It hasn't found its thing yet, so it's sort of stuck out there. Um, and, and I think it needs its thing. I don't, I don't know what that is, um, but uh, I, I'm just really proud and, and excited to be part of that. And, yeah, I think it's... Well, I first read about you in the 1990s mm -hmm. in my environmental justice class in college. <laughs> so it, it, it has been slowly starting, so that's good. Well, <laughs> well the thing is that where, where the, I think where the environmental justice movement gets stuck is on its goals. Mm -hmm. Is it really about disproportionate, or is it disproportionate in something else? Right. And so some groups get really focused on this disproportionate um, dumping on, on people who are poor or brown or black or whatever, and that's important. But is that really going to get you where you need to go? So where's the something else? And so that's where the, some of them are getting stuck. And so we help try to help figure that out for them. Okay, getting stuck there. But like, what, what else can we talk about? And um, one of the things we did extraordinarily well was we did this um, series of conversations called, we call it, we internally called it Eco Devo, but it was economic development. So go, instead of going in and talking about how you're being poisoned by all these industries and how your children are sick and blah, 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 let's begin with what don't you have in this community? What do you need? And if not this nasty thing, what would you, what would you choose? The most dynamic conversations ever because nobody, and actually this one gentleman in um, in Atlanta, Blackhawk County, uh, African American uh, older fella stood up and said, "Well, Ms. Gibbs, I didn't know we were allowed to speak about that. I didn't know we were allowed to think about that." And I said, "Well, if you need permission, sir, consider it done and and do it." And and this is a very poor rural community, but they came up with a great big plan. And in North Carolina, they ended up opening up a farmers market, and you know. People who go to the beach past this area, and it was a big economic thing for them. And and so so they, that's where your pickles come from, Mount Olive. You know, Mount Olive pickles. Do you know they did not have a farmers market in Mount Olive? You couldn't buy a fresh piece of fruit or vegetable in Mount Olive. That was just like ridiculous. But sure, we can come up with a plan for this. They would they were they beat back a landfill twice, and instead they they started this whole big farmers market stuff. But after that, you know, really looking at. Yes, we have to recognize and acknowledge that this is disproportionate and it's wrong and it shouldn't happen. And if it happens, you can't clean it up, then you should move the people, right? But um, what else do you guys want? What else is there? And I think that's the way to think about it. Well, I think the other bigger frame there, too, is, you know, in the last couple of decades, globalization has really reshaped everything. And now there are lots of love canals in China yeah. and in Mexico. 
and in Vietnam and in the Philippines and all over the world. And so, you know, we sometimes really pat ourselves on the back of how much we've cleaned up the environment here in this country. But a lot of what we've done is exported our pollution, right? Exported our love canals to countries that have authoritarian rule and no environmental laws. And that's not a victory either. It's not a victory, but it's well disguised. And again, it's well disguised by those in power. Yeah. And that goes back to government. If we want the government, if we want a country that respects the environment, if we want a country that treats people equally, if we want a country that we're proud of, then we've got to change the way the government is. And I think one of the big questions is how do we get money out of politics? Because yeah. you know <clears throat> they're in office because you know because somebody gave them a big chunk of change. So how has your relationship to the rest of nature changed since you were a little girl growing up <coughs> on Grand Island and you know, run down to the, to the river? And, and what, what, how do you even understand what nature is anymore? And how has your relationship changed to just, you know, the environment with the air and water? Actually, <coughs> it hasn't. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it hasn't because I was never into nature. <laughs> I, I, sorry. <coughs> no, it's the cold water. I get the cold water. The cold water. <laughs> I, you know, everybody says, oh, you're an environmentalist. I actually was never an environmentalist. And Grand Island was like a beautiful environment, which I hated, by the way. <laughs> so, so. My, my relationship hasn't changed with the environment. It's there. I want to protect it. I enjoy it when I go to the beach or I enjoy it when I go mountain climbing in Colorado. Or, um, But my real passion is for people. And how do we right the wrongs of the people who are being harmed by what we're doing to the environment? And if you could go back and talk to yourself, the little girl back in Grand Island, what, what would you say about, you know, what, what was coming and, and what you should be ready for? I think I'd say, I think I'd say I, was, I should listen to my mother a little closer and how she dealt with all six of us children fighting over different things. So I know how to deal with the adults that are fighting over different things. Um, I, you know, and I often say most of what I did, I learned from my mother. Like, my mother said, you take out the garbage, you do the dishes, you set the table. How do you do, you know, tasks in the, in the organization and stuff like that? Um, but I, <clears throat> I don't know. I think, I think the thing I would say is, like, you have no clue what's going to happen to you, girl. <laughs> Listen to your mom. Watch how she works. That's your best advice. <laughs> awesome. Well, I asked you to bring a quotation. To I did. To, uh, to kind of end the show. Um, so I was wondering if you could... Read that and I almost forgot it not in the car. <laughs> I'm copying yeah. But um, yeah, tell us the, the quotation, but also what's what's the significance to you? You want some significance first? No, no, it's a okay. quote. So this is this is John Lewis, Representative John Lewis, and his quote is a democracy cannot thrive where power remains unchecked and justice is reserved for a select few. Ignoring these cries and failing to respond is simply not an option, for peace cannot exist where justice is not served. Get in trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. And it's, you know, it is, John Lewis has dedicated his life to the civil rights movement, and, you know, it, it's really, in 1963, when he was with Martin Luther King and building the march on Washington, you know, it, it's still true today that you know we have to get in trouble, in good trouble, and and we really, you know, if we don't do something, the powerful will always be powerful, and we will always be crying foul and, and crying hurt, and and we really need to do it. And he he just exemplifies that whole thing of power and trade. And talk about risk, I mean, he was on, he was on Bloody Sunday. 
Uh, he walked across the bridge in Selma. You know, he, you know, he's just an incredibly courageous man. And guess what? He took all those risks. He did get arrested. He got clobbered over the head a few times. Uh, God knows what else happened to him. But he became the representative of the United States of America. So there to be a poor, you don't have to be all that afraid. You know, that you still can be a, a huge, powerful person in America, have a good job and a family life, you know, standing up and taking risks. And I think that's that's the message and, and what I really liked about Representative John. Well, you've certainly gotten yourself in good trouble. Yes. <laughs> and thank you for doing that. And thank you so much for doing this. It's been amazing. Well, thank you. We have just about 10 minutes of air time left. Um, so if you if we could get you know, two or three questions aside, that would be terrific. If you want to come on down, uh, that would be, would be a deal. While someone's thinking about it, um, or you coming just in time. A book I read actually said that the EPA agents said they were the best oatmeal cookies they'd ever had. <laughs> That may be true. Uh, when Dr. Lucas was in Ohio and he was doing something equally nasty for EPA that he was doing for us, I sent a leader over to the meeting with a bakery box and on it it said, I hope you enjoy these cookies, you're happy, or your hostage holder Lois. <laughs> he put the box down, picked up his briefcase, put on his two coat, walked out, took the rental car, the EPA rental car, went to the airport and left everybody else there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming and telling some great stories. Really appreciate it. I, uh, um, I remember reading Michael Brown's Laying Waste, which uh, chronicled a lot of the stories and some of the nationwide uh, coverage that you've uh, done. I was wondering what you think of the evolution from the Superfund program to like the voluntary cleanup and the brownfield type program. Do you think that's an effective uh, progression of that or do you think that's a setback? I think it depends on who's doing it. Okay. In certain states, the Brownfield program, they are really careful about, because it's about reuse for the, for the most part, um, and they clean it up well, and they reuse it well. Uh, sadly, the vast majority of the places, they're just cleaning it up, putting low-income housing and stuff on top of it. So it's not so good, or baseball fields, where small children are gonna be on top of it. So I think the concept is good. I think the carrying out of it is not consistent, and it really depends on, if the truth is, it really depends on the state and how aggressive the environmental and, and public um, advocacy groups are in that state. And New York State has some really good folks here right. that really work very hard. But, you know, Mississippi Brownfield being, you, you use a rake and you take all of the visible stuff off and then you build housing mm -hmm. for low-income families. Yeah, I've, I've worked a lot in Texas and Louisiana mm -hmm. and the way the groups there talk about the state environmental. I mean, it's just they're there to work for the industry. Yeah, that's that's their their goal. I have a question. Um, so you mentioned the split earlier, and I was thinking about how that applies to conversations I have, for example, with conservative family members, and why the environment has become really since like McCain um, and Obama election uh, a, a partisan issue. And I wonder if that's become a roadblock for you before the years. Because it's my understanding that it wasn't as much of a partisan issue before. And how do you bridge those conversations with people who, you know, might view this as a liberal issue or, you know, not a conservative issue? How do you address those roadblocks with people? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I do believe it's a partisan, it's now being framed as a partisan issue. 
um, and that, you know, all the liberals and the progressives and the Democrats, they all want to clean up the environment and the Republicans don't. The truth of the matter is it's not true. It, it really is not true. And like I said before, you know, President Trump cleaned up more Superfund sites in his four years than has been cleaned up by the agency over the last 10 years. So it's, it's not true. And, and my, my comeback is it's not true. It just it just is not true, and we, and we shouldn't encourage that because by repeating it, what we do is every time you repeat it, then somebody believes it to be true, even though they won't say it to your face. Um, and and I think one of the keys for us to do as leaders is to make sure that when people come up on stage, they identify themselves as a as a conservative, not necessarily Republican or Democrat, but as a conservative. Or you know, we had this PTA mom. She was she was a Christian coalition member from Waco, Texas. And they're like, well, people in Waco don't care. Well, I most certainly do. And she had organized her school and stuff. So we really need to find those those folks out there that are doing the work to stand up and do testimony to show that it's really not true in the field. It's it's only the narrative that the politicians put out there because they you know, want to shift things. Well, and I think one of the, the things that are <laughs> that Isabella, by the way, works with the podcast and is one of the amazing graduates from UB. Um, but um, one, of, one of the things um, that I think Isabella is getting at is this idea of language. Like Newt Gingrich in the 90s was talking about climate change and how it was something we had to aggressively address. And then at some point, the Republicans basically said you can't mention climate change anymore. And it became a politicized word. Um, so, do you? What do you do around language and around communication to communicate with different groups of people to get them on board with what you're doing, but maybe using different types of language? Yeah, I mean, I think when we're looking at the national language that that politicians people are using, I think that's a problem, and we can't. I don't know how we change that. But if you look at community language, you can, right? So. So Ronald Reagan was talking about the bird's nest in the White House or some silly thing like that when he took over. But then all this stuff happened, right? And you know, he is a Republican and, and he did a lot of different environmental things. And and so we have to point out where it did happen and then use the narrative and the language of our folks. They, there's not a there's not a language for the public. There are languages for different audiences. And and the question is who, we don't want. We can't move everybody. We just can't. Um, but who do we want to move? And what is the language that would move that set of people? Is it moms? Like if we want to move moms, and we say, "Well, say what you want, Republican, Democrat, liberal, or conservative, doesn't matter." Here's the thing: I want my great grandchildren to be able to drink clean water and breathe clean air. And you can call it what you want. You can call it super funny, or whatever. You can call it climate change, but. This is what I want. So find language that says the same thing, but but looks at a you know a particular audience. I think that's what you really. We as a country need to move audiences, and we can't in, we can't keep buying into this narrative that's up here with the words they use and we repeat. It's one of the things we we teach our community leaders because first thing they always do is repeat what the other side said. Well, accidental petroleum said there was no problem at Love Canal. So why why are we so upset? How dare they say that? There is a problem, Love Canal. No, you let it wrong, right? Why didn't you start with that sentence? Why didn't you start the, with a different sentence that says there's a problem with Love Canal and Oxy needs to be educated, you know, instead of repeating these things. So I think we really have to think strategically as a community, like who are the audiences we can move? And thinking about climate, for example, or sustainability, who buys the products? You're talking about sustainability, who buys a product? That's the audience we want to move. And then how do we move that audience? And we're not going to do whatever they do in DC because they're all just a bunch of goofs up there anyhow. But how do we really move that audience and what is the language you need? And I think that's the way we have to think about this. There is not a cookie cutter language and narrative for everybody. One of the first shows I did for the podcast was with the evangelical um, climate activist. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how he doesn't use the words nature and environmentalism or environment. Um, he talks about creation and creation care. And when he reframes it like that and talks about how the Bible calls for us to, you know, 
protect and, and lots of other things that are in the Bible around our relationship with nature, then it gets through. Yeah. But in stripping away that language, it has become politicized yes. and it, it signifies other things. Well, if you look at the look at the evolution of climate change and language, it started with global warming. And people are like, "Well, I'm in Buffalo; it ain't warm here." You know, we would wait for it to get warm someday. So, you know, if you look at the evolution of the words, because it wasn't working, right? Right. And so, this is where they are. So, just look. You don't have to go back that far. Here's how that's all changed. Other questions? Hi, first of all, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure when you were younger, you had a lot of self-doubts when this first started. And I'd like to know uh, how you worked through them. And then also, second part of the question, are you an optimist about the future, or are you a pessimist? OK, so self-doubts, you know, um, I still have them. Uh, you know, they say, well, when you go on stage, you, when you speak, then do you get in nervous stomach anymore? Yes, I do. Um, because I'm trying to change things, and I'm trying to convince people that they, they're powerful and they're right. It's really hard to do. And, um, you know, I think self-doubts are healthy because it makes you rethink. Before you take your first step, you're just like, no, is this really the step I want to take? Is this the time to take this step? Is this the, is this the place to take that step? And so... I, I always used it as a way to assure myself that I was doing the right thing. So, so I would, I, I rarely moved quickly. It was always very thoughtful and, and, and that kind of internal struggle. But it may only take, you know, a few hours, but it, it still, is this really what I want to do? And I am totally optimistic. I think, I think the whole environment right now sucks big time. We're hurting. But I believe in the people. I believe that at some point, and I don't know what the tipping point is, but I think at some point, just like we saw in the 70s, you will have 100,000 people in Washington, D.C. saying, look, we're changing this. Enough is enough. And, and you know, that's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to organize it, but I'll be there. Um, you know, that I, I believe in the people. And I think right now people are struggling themselves. And they're going to have to figure that one out. I'm very optimistic. You're going to provide a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll bring the bullhorns. <laughs> Our final question this evening from Ms. Tiffany Green. So I kind of, I have a multi-part question. I actually work in Niagara Falls right now, so I see a lot of what is still going on at the falls. We see a lot of those disadvantaged communities still facing some of the issues, whether it's post-Love Canal or even issues that have arisen since. So the first part is, what are your opinions on that? And the second part is, having been in Niagara Falls and knowing that area, who do you think should really be involved in terms of community members and stakeholders? And what do we need to do to kind of continue what's already been done? Thank you. That was a great question. Um, you know, Niagara Falls is, <laughs> it is what it is. It, it is exactly the same as it was. And, and what Niagara Falls needs is leadership with Couple of this? <laughs> 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 we need leadership that has some, some backbone because the problem in Niagara Falls is 54 industries there and they're all chemical industries. And the city is dependent on these chemical industries. And it's like the city is being held hostage by these chemical industries. And they encourage, I remember when Harry was in Goodyear, that they would send these newsletters home, but were just ridiculous. Somebody was complaining about a chemical today. Ha ha ha! That wasn't even. That was like no different than salt or a drop of removed in the swimming pool or something else. I don't know. Whatever they did, but they belittling it and brainwashing the workers. And and I don't think anything can happen in Niagara Falls until there's somebody who is elected and to the council and as well as mayor who who are working together to say this is it. But Niagara Falls has a great opportunity to be a tourist city. And it tried to do this parallel path, tourism and industrial economic building. It, it, it can't work together. And so I, I have hope for Niagara Falls, but I think that there's never been, at least in my experience so far, never been anyone in power who would stand up to those chemical industries. And I'm, I'm personally, I'm not sure that that person would survive anyhow. These industries are brutal. They're bullies. Um, 
and so it's going to take the people to really make that happen. All right, to wrap up, um, we'd like to, one more time, uh, we want to thank um, Mr. Stephen Lester, who's been here with Buddy the Dog, <laughs> and Ralph Cutelli, and Hope Dunbar, John Feesh, and ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Lois Gibbs. <laughs> Next month, sorry Josh, I showed it up. Next month, please do keep us in mind. Mark your calendar for May 12th. May 12th, we will uh, be talking with Dr. Richard Primack from uh, Boston College. He is a world-renowned uh, uh, biogeographer uh, and a best-selling author. That'll be in the evening on May 12th uh, on, at 6 p.m. Thank you all so much for coming out. Again, safe travels, and we'll see you next month.